Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to the eighth season of Heart to Heart with Anna. Our theme this season is care for adults with congenital heart defects, and we have a great show today. Today's show is Long-Term Consequences of a Fond Hand Physiology, and our guests are Dr. Wilson Lamb and Lauren Bednards. Wilson Lamb is a board-certified cardiologist who specializes in adult congenital cardiology and rhythm disorders. A native Houstonian, he graduated from Rice University and obtained his entire medical training at Baylor College of Medicine, completing residency in combined internal medicine and pediatrics, and fellowships in adult cardiovascular diseases, pediatric cardiology, and clinical cardiac electrophysiology. Although he manages various cardiac issues, his primary focus is caring for adult patients with congenital heart disease who also have rhythm disorders, such as palpitations, passing out, or sudden death. He is experienced in antiarrhythmic medications, cardiac implantable electronic devices such as pacemakers and defibrillators, and catheter ablations for challenging rhythm issues. He has presented at local and national conferences. Other interests include medical education and use of technology in novel arenas. Dr. Lamb serves as Assistant Professor and Associate Program Director for the Internal Medicine Residency Program at Baylor College of Medicine. We'll meet Lauren Bednards in the second segment of the show. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Dr. Lamb. It's my pleasure to be here, Anna. Well, I guess I should have said welcome back. I'm so excited to have you back. My longtime listeners may remember you from season six on the show entitled Seizing the Day with Dr. Wilson Lamb. Well, it is definitely great to be back, and I love speaking about rhythm issues and about adult congenital heart disease. I was very excited about having you back on the show for this season because you specialize in taking care of adults with CHDs. Can you tell us what attracted you to working in that field? Yes. Well, I'd have to say that medicine draws those who really love helping others and using a scientific background. Knowing that the heart is a pump, it's really more like engineering. And I think I was a wannabe engineer growing up. Congenital heart disease really takes those engineering principles of the heart as a pump and electricity and applies it to the very most challenging cases. So my goals are to improve the lives of young individuals over a lifetime and sometimes we get to see the most grateful patients because they see such a bright future ahead for them. Right, they can really see a lot of changes when they go from having palpitations or fainting spells or arrhythmias where they just don't feel so good and all of a sudden it's almost like you wave a magic wand and fix them. Not quite a magic wand. We definitely have to approach it from various aspects, but I do definitely enjoy hearing that they're feeling better, and hopefully we can control the palpitations as best as possible. Well, many of our listeners have a Fontan physiology, so can you tell me about the long-term consequences that you most commonly deal with as an electrophysiologist with those patients who have had a Fontan? Sure, Anna. Probably the most frequent thing that all patients feel might be palpitations. Even those of us with a structurally normal heart can feel singleton skips every now and then. Sometimes we even feel it faster, a few beats, dup, 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 dup. But Fontan patients are extremely susceptible to palpitations that can come from the upper chambers, known as atrial tachycardias, and from the lower chambers, known as ventricular tachycardia. Both of these types of arrhythmias can be dangerous because the prior can lead to strokes, or passing out, or weakening of the heart muscle, and the latter could lead to sudden death. Fatigue, lightheadedness, those can sometimes be the presenting symptoms of a failing Fontan circulation, and there may be a rhythm disorder that explains it. It's a vicious cycle because patients that stay stuck in these palpitations for a long period of time can beget more palpitations and a weak heart muscle and increased clot risk that can then lead to some of those complications palpitations, heart failure, stroke, passing out, and preventing sudden death are all the main issues that I face as an adult congenital rhythm specialist. Okay, so then if a patient is starting to feel palpitations, but they still have nine months until they see their cardiologist, should they try and get in earlier so they can try and attack this problem sooner? 
I think it's very important to maintain open lines of communication with patients. I actually give my email address on out to all of my patients, and I have means of communicating with them on a more regular basis. Sometimes the palpitations they report are mild, short-lived, or have a very good explanation and may not necessitate a frequent visit. However, if palpitations are increasing in frequency, severity, duration, those are all reasons to contact the cardiologist and work in an earlier visit to evaluate for some of these sustained palpitations. If we can catch them and know what they are, we can sometimes treat them with medications or give a better prediction on the trajectory of the disease process. I think one of the things that's difficult for me as a mother when my son was younger was he never seemed to feel any palpitations. And even when I watched him getting an EKG and I could see that he was having an irregular heartbeat, he never noticed it. Now that he's older, I still don't think he has any, but we've noticed with a Holter monitor that he has had some problems. So for him, since he's never really felt any, if he starts to actually feel them, is that a real warning sign? It's very interesting. Many people with structurally normal hearts and palpitations don't even feel the palpitations either. So even though half of the population may have skip beats, half of those may not even feel them. So I think that your son is actually in probably a large minority or the majority of patients that may not be fully in tune to feeling some of those irregular beats. Now, if he does feel irregular beats, he might still be feeling those skips that he had before, but if they're more prominent, if they make him feel dizzy, or if he passes out because of them, those are definitely red flags that should come to a cardiologist's attention. One of the guests that I had on my show a couple seasons ago developed an app for anyone's phone. It's a free app that's out there. It's called My Heart App and it's all together, there's no spaces. That has an opportunity for people to keep a daily log of any time that they feel arrhythmias. It even has a little stopwatch where you can click it and determine how long the palpitations or any of the bad feelings that you might have are occurring, including dizziness and some of the other symptoms that you recommended. Do you think that if you're experiencing regular problems, having an app like that on your phone where you actually do recordings would be helpful for the cardiologist? I love it, Anna. I love that technology is becoming more applicable to all of our patients. And I love how everyone has some access to cell phones and technology that it becomes something more readily accessible. Before, when we told patients to go to the grocery store and check their blood pressure and write down a log, it actually became a challenge and it was a hassle. And very few patients would want to keep up with it. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that technology's advances onto our phones and the ability to check things immediately and have it store those values already provides an opportunity to relay that information. I'm a huge fan of gathering data and being able to relay it to a cardiologist. And we can sift through that information to figure out what are the relevant points and figure out if there's a clue to the symptoms, the timing, and those palpitations. I agree with you. I love how technology is advancing to the point where it can be so helpful to us. I think if doctors could recommend that people do this kind of thing where they keep track of their symptoms and record it so that they can then give that to the doctor that it could be helpful. But I think it has to come from the doctors sometimes. Not from Absolutely. The moms. <laughs> I agree. And I think that the more research we have out there so that we can know that there's cost effective, inexpensive technology that's available on cell phones that can help reliably inform us so that we can act on preventable illness, we would love to have that. Right, right. Well, I'm going to be asking for your advice in the third segment when we're with Lauren. But for now, I have one more question for you, and that is what kind of devices do most Fontanners need and what trends are you seeing regarding the use of these devices? Wonderful. So many Fontans that were performed before the mid-1990s or 2000 have a higher likelihood of palpitations because of the concepts that we thought sewing the original parts of the heart might make the blood flow more pulsatile. It didn't really work out as well as we thought, and that actually led to larger scar tissue, bigger stretch in some of those chambers, and the bigger stretch would then lead to more palpitations down the road. So I would say that Fontans that were performed before the mid-90s, probably half of them or more, end up requiring a pacemaker of some sorts. Pacemakers oftentimes are used when we have to use medicines to slow the heart rate down, particularly if there are palpitations, or 
in case those medicines reduce the likelihood of flutters and atrial fibrillation, they too might slow the heart rate down requiring a pacemaker. Some of the newer Fontans after the year 2000 or the mid-90s actually incorporate man-made tissue that's less prone to stretching, has less scar, and may require pacemakers less frequently, perhaps less than 5 to 10 percent of the time. So time will tell if those newer Fontans have a lower requirement for a pacemaker. These pacemakers also have the ability to pace the heart out of atrial flutter, and that's nice, especially some of the newer pacemakers that have it as an automatic feature, reducing the need for patients to come to the emergency room to get paced out. Defibrillators are another type of electronic technology that can detect the dangerous rhythms, the ventricular tachycardias from the lower chambers that might lead to passing out or sudden death. Sometimes those are required if the squeeze of the heart isn't good, or if we've seen those rhythms frequently before. The newer variety of those are actually placed underneath the skin to detect and shock the heart out of dangerous rhythms. It's very important because these devices can't sit inside the heart because of the likelihood of developing a clot on them. Most of the times they're either put on the surface of the heart, we call them epicardial devices, or the most recent implantable cardiac defibrillator is put under the skin, called a subcutaneous ICD. Thank you, Dr. Lamb, for sharing that information. Now it's time for a quick commercial break, but don't leave yet, listeners, because coming up next, we're going to talk with Lauren Bednards about what challenges she has faced growing up with a Fontan heart. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart Within, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is Long-Term Consequences of a Fontan Physiology, and our guests are Dr. Wilson Lamb and Lauren Bednards. We just finished talking with Dr. Wilson Lamb about working with Fontan survivors from an electrophysiologist perspective, and now we'll turn our attention to Lauren Bednards. Lauren Bednards is 29 years old. She was born with tricuspid atresia, or hypoplastic right heart syndrome. She has had two open heart surgeries, the second being a Fontan in 1989. Lauren happily married her husband, Chris, in 2011. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology from the University of Michigan Dearborn. She enjoys couponing, reading, playing video and board games, and reaching out to the congenital heart defect community on and offline. For the last eight years, Lauren has been a strong advocate in the CHD community. She was one of the 2016 Central Texas Congenital Heart Walk co-chairs that took place on April 23, 2016. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Lauren. Thank you for having me again. I know. Again, this is the fifth time, Lauren. I know. I can't believe it. (laughs) So my longtime listeners probably feel like they already know you. You have been on so many times. Which was your favorite episode to do with me, Lauren? Probably the one with my husband, Chris, because he's not a huge talker, especially when it comes to my heart. So to have been able to get him to do it was really cool. And he was so sweet. And we also had Jenny and Nick Busta on that show. So listeners, if you haven't had a chance to listen to that show, go back and listen to it. All of our shows are archived on Blog Talk Radio. And that was a fun show for me to do. It was ACHD years in love. Thank you for coming on the show today to talk to us about the Fontan heart. And I know that you have had a number of different concerns that have been consequences of the Fontan physiology. So can you tell us what kind of problems you've experienced and what warning signs you had? I guess you could say I'm lucky, but I really hate that word because everybody is different when it comes to their heart. Everyone adjusts to the Fontan differently. So whatever issues they get will definitely be individual. Me, personally, the biggest problem that I had is I was diagnosed with supraventricular tricardia when I was about 16, 17 years old. And the warning signs that I had is I could tell that my heart was just going really, really fast. I get really sweaty, passed out a few times, dizzy, lightheaded, and it didn't matter how much water I drank and anything would set it off. So I was lucky to have been able to get it diagnosed quickly. As soon as I started having those symptoms, I was always one growing up that if something was different and something was abnormal, even if it sounded silly to me, I was always afraid something really bad was going to happen to me because my parents always told me, 
tell me how you're feeling and if anything feels abnormal tell them so when I was feeling abnormal I told them right away and it was diagnosed within probably a month span and I was put on beta blockers which is a medication to lower my heart rate and I'm still on beta blockers right now I'm on antenanol 50 milligrams, which is luckily controlling it. We did try sold law, but unfortunately my body didn't like it or respond very well to it. But luckily I'm stable at the moment and I haven't had any ER visits or anything like that yet. So that's basically my main issue that I've been having. So. Okay. Okay. So you are a textbook for what Dr. Lamb was just talking about. Pretty much. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) So that's really interesting. Well, Lori, many of the people that I've been talking with over the last several years have talked about liver problems. Is this something that you're concerned about? And when did your doctor start talking to you about the possibility of having a liver problem? Well, actually, no doctor really brought it up. My first cardiologist, I had him for 22 years. He was a pediatric cardiologist. He was the one that told me that I should probably start seeing an adult congenital heart cardiologist. And at that time, I started researching. I went to the University of Michigan for a little bit at Mott's Children's and also went to Stanford. I've been to Atlanta, Georgia. So I basically researched the Fontan and I went specifically to doctors that had known about all the issues. And in my research, I found about the liver issues. So I made sure that everyone that I went to had already known about the liver issues so I can make sure I felt like I was being proactive in knowing that they were already on top of research in order to catch anything before it happens. When I found out about it, I was definitely concerned because I had never heard about it. It makes sense because our hearts have to work overtime and some of the big vessels go directly over the liver and the liver has to work harder. So I can totally see why we can get damaged. I'm seeing a liver doctor right now. I see him once a year. He runs blood tests. I get ultrasound sounds and every once in a while I get MRIs and eventually probably a biopsy but he doesn't really feel like that's necessary right now. Okay well that's good. So it's not like you are experiencing any problems or you had any symptoms that led you to that. It was just your research and wanting to be proactive. Is that right? Right. What I found and what many doctors have found including Dr. Lamb is a lot of us don't experience liver issues sometimes until the liver is really bad. So I think it's important to start at least looking at our liver at a certain age to start monitoring it. Okay, that sounds like good advice. And we're going to be asking more advice in the third segment, but I have one more question for you for this segment and that is what do you think are the most important signs or symptoms that adult Fontaners need to be aware of? And when do you think they need to seek the help of a doctor? In my opinion, I think anything abnormal, whether it's minor or major in their eyes as regards to their heart, anything abnormal, it should be told to the doctor. You need an open, honest communication with them. You shouldn't hide anything. Even if you think it's totally silly or it's all in your head, it could get you in trouble. So I'd say anything that pops up is when you should contact your cardiologist, silly or not, because it may save your life. Okay, I like that idea. I like that a lot. And I like what Dr. Lamb said too, saying that he even gives his email address to his patients so they can shoot him an email if they're concerned. I really like that. I think that we do have to have good communication with the doctors. Because like you said, everything could be going fine and then you may be afraid, oh, I think I just had this silly little flutter, maybe it's no big deal. But if you can shoot an email to your doctor, then you can get reassurance that, oh no, what were you doing? How long did it last? Whatever. And then they can say, oh no, it's no big deal. Or yeah, let's maybe have you in for a quick check. I mean, I think it's better to be safe than sorry. Oh, absolutely. Because you know what? In life, Whether you have a heart condition or not, I've learned that things can change in an instant. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Lauren. This has been really interesting. We need to take another quick commercial break, but don't leave yet, listeners, because coming up next, we're going to talk to Dr. Lamb and Lauren about what advice they have for others in the CHD community. We'll be right back. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. 
You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is long-term consequences of Lafontaine physiology, and our guests are Dr. Wilson Lamb and Lauren Bednards. We just finished talking with Lauren about what she has experienced regarding her health since she's lived with Lafontaine physiology for over 20 years. And in this segment, we'll have everybody in the studio together, and I'm eager to see what advice Dr. Wilson Lamb and Lauren have to share with us. So, Dr. Lamb, I would like to start with you. Even though you're an electrophysiologist, I know you're also a pediatric cardiologist, and I'd like to know if you know of any research that has looked at statistics regarding Fontaners needing a Fontan revision or transplant. And what advice do you have for Fontaners if a doctor tells them that they may need an extra cardiac Fontan or a transplant? Sure, Anna. I think the most important advice is looking for a center with experience. I love what Lauren has done, and she's done her homework and looked at places that have done a ton of surgeries pertinent to her on the Fontan circulation. So knowing the options and the percentages of risks, the likelihood of benefit, and other alternatives are extremely important for the failing Fontan because we want to get it right in the right order. The Fontan revision, which is changing an older Fontan pre-mid-90s into one of the newer Fontans of the 21st century, is very key in hopes of reducing arrhythmias to reduce those palpitations to improve quality of life. And we really want to minimize downstream risk and complications, reduce the risk of strokes, reduce the risk of hospitalization, and hopefully prolong great quality of life. When patients start to have issues such as liver disease and more than just scarring, but going all the way to frank cirrhosis, or if the gut starts sloughing out protein, causing loose bowel movements called protein-losing enteropathy, that oftentimes poses problems to the body, including immune suppression and malnutrition. So the treatment of choice for that protein-losing enteropathy or liver disease is oftentimes the heart transplantation. That ends up being what we should go forward with. However, a heart transplant leaves the body also with immune suppression and also at risk for rejection of that foreign tissue. If the heart has a low squeeze, but everything else is good with the Fontan circulation, sometimes we have used pumps called ventricular assist devices to help take over the cardiac output. That poses risks of infections of the drive lines that come through the skin, as well as strokes. So keeping the body thinned out is very important. And sometimes an anatomic fix, such as a leaky valve or an obstruction that's too narrow, can be stented or surgically repaired to improve symptoms. We here at Texas Children's have looked at this and we've proposed a FACET score, F-A-C-E-T, that looks at the function, squeeze of the heart, the presence of arrhythmias, cyanosis or low oxygen levels, enteropathy or that sloughing of diarrhea, as well as thrombus for the T, clots that might cause strokes or go off to other places in the body that aren't very nice. That was an excellent explanation. Some of us parents have been told that heart transplant is the fourth stage procedure in hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Are they saying that anymore, Dr. Lamb? Sometimes in challenging hypoplastic left heart syndrome, it can sometimes be the first option if we're not sure the right ventricle can tolerate years and years of wear and tear. So sometimes it goes to as the first option, but if everything goes smoothly, It may end up being the final common pathway. We are hopeful that the ventricular assist device could buy time for a failing Fontan where the right ventricle doesn't squeeze very well and avoid the risk of rejection and immune suppression, but have the risk of skin infections through the drive line or uh, clot. So there is potential of still using these ventricular assist devices as a bridge before the transplant. And hopefully if our stem cell technology catches up with us, we may be able to transplant people's own type tissue into the body to avoid the risk of immune suppression and avoid that risk of rejection. Oh, that's what I am hoping and praying will happen. It's very exciting to see some of the research that's being done. The ventricular assist device does seem like it's something fairly new. It's just been around for what, like the last 10 years or so? That's about the time that it's Mm -hmm. been done. And we here in Houston at Texas Heart Institute have had the opportunity to implant more ventricular assist devices than virtually any center across the world. 
Well, that just shows why Texas is such a great state, doesn't it? (laughs) (laughs) All three of us are Texas, so I want my listeners to know I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek. However, Uh I do live in Texas for a good reason. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) Okay. Well, Lauren, I have a question for you, sweetie. You've had to endure a lot of different visits to see specialists over the years. What advice do you have for other Fontaners regarding communicating with so many different kinds of doctors? Don't be afraid to take notes if you're the forgetful type, because it's actually good if they're all on the same page. I try to encourage all my doctors to try to communicate with each other as best they can, if they can. That way they're hearing from each other and discussing next steps of anything that may go wrong. But I also try to update them too, and I have to make sure I mention it, even though that's not what they do, because it all flows together. So I just want them to all be updated and on the same page. I think it's important. I do too. I think what's challenging is when you have doctors in different cities. I know that you've had eye issues, you've had scoliosis to deal with, now you're dealing with a liver doctor. Are you also going to a lot of different centers and do you find it challenging to have them communicating with each other? I see Dr. Lamb and fortunately my liver doctor, Dr. Sussman, is right across the street at Baylor. So they communicate very well together. As far as my back, I only need to be seen every five years and there's really nothing they can do for it anyways. And my eyes, I'm kind of like two years overdue, which is really bad. (laughs) So I actually don't have a doctor yet here in Texas. I've lived here two years, so that's shame on me. (laughs) But I have to find one. So luckily, it's usually easy as far as any primary doctor or OBGYN. If I wanted them to talk to Dr. Lamb or Dr. Sussman, I know they would be more than happy to talk to them. But luckily, I usually don't have any issues when I get sick and my primary care doctor prescribes me antibiotics. Usually, if it's an antibiotic I've never had before, I usually just run it by Dr. Lamb and just see if it's okay with the meds I'm on and my specific situation. That's a good answer, although the heart mommy in me is saying, Lauren, <laughs> you need to find an eye doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah, uh, my husband always nags me anyways, so <laughs> I'm about it. Okay, well, the last question is for Dr. Lamb. So, Dr. Lamb, How common is it for Fontaners to need a maze procedure, radiofrequency ablation, or some other kind of procedure to deal with arrhythmias, and what signs should alert Fontaners to the fact that they may need to address their arrhythmias more aggressively? That's a great question, Anna. I think that for the older Fontans, the ones before the mid-90s, about half of them will eventually have atrial arrhythmias, if not more than half of them. And our first option to approach this is medical management. And we'll try antiarrhythmic medicines to help calm down the storm. I like to say that there are three things that tend to lead to atrial palpitations, and they are scar from prior surgery, stretch from the heart's ability to squeeze or certain chambers that weren't meant to go up against higher pressure, and then stress, which can include infections, sleep apnea, higher doses of alcohol or excessive doses of caffeine. But when you throw all of that together and these arrhythmias break through over and over and over again, despite medicines that are aimed at stopping those palpitations, those are the patients who would benefit the most from a maze procedure or an ablation. Ablations are useful if the Fontan pressures haven't increased significantly high enough, and we think that we can do benefit just by cutting off some of the small circuits. But if the pressure in the Fontan has built up to a very, very, very high level, then no amount of ablation will stop the formation of newer and newer and newer circuits, and that's where the Fontan conversion plus a maze procedure is beneficial over that of an ablation. So anyone who has continued palpitations, perhaps with dizzy spells or passing out spells, despite the best medical therapy, those are the patients who are going to benefit from the maze procedure the best. Sometimes we can actually touch up any breakthroughs in those maze procedures using a catheter ablation, but the maze is a better approach in the Fontan circulation. That's really interesting that you said that. My son has had a Fontan revision, and while the doctor was in there, he did a modified maze procedure on him, even though Alex had never really complained of any arrhythmias. Is that something that can be addressed intraoperatively, even if the patient hasn't complained of any arrhythmias? 
Sure. If we start seeing the early signs of palpitations, even three, five, ten beats in a row that look like they're coming from an abnormal place, sometimes that can be the very beginning of these palpitations that beget more palpitations, that beget more palpitations. And performing that maze procedure while the heart's already open and stopped allows us to nip things in the bud to redirect the traffic of electricity through the heart to get a more normal rhythm. Now, there are some times that if those lines are incomplete, there may be a little area that needs a touch-up because that could be the setup for a future palpitation. But overall, because of the success of a maze, most patients who get a Fontan conversion from the older version to a newer version are going to get the maze procedure and a pacemaker put in at the same time while the chest is already open, get it all done simultaneously. So it's not uncommon to put a pacemaker in almost prophylactically? Yes. As a matter of fact, sometimes pacemaker leads are put in and a device isn't put in necessarily if the heart doesn't require it. But most times a pacemaker is put in prophylactically because the only way to put those pacing leads on the outside of the heart is to crack the sternal bones. And if we have to go in a second time, oftentimes there's more scar tissue to go through and that can lead to more bleeding risk and complications. So to put all of these together oftentimes makes sense and a good maze or an aggressive maze oftentimes slows the conduction enough that they probably will be needing to utilize a little bit of that pacemaker function every now and then. Wow, you doctors have so much to learn when it comes to dealing with these really complicated Fontan hearts. It can be a challenge. Again, a lot of the people here are really dedicated to making sure that our patients get the best care possible. Oh, I know. I love my son's doctors. They are very important people to me. Okay, Lauren, what was the most important life lesson that you can share with us having grown up with a Fontan heart? Enjoy life. Everyone is presented with challenges in life, and my parents would tell me that over and over again. Everyone deals with their own challenges and issues, and some of them may look bigger than others or smaller than other people, but despite whatever challenges we go through with our heart, we can live full, happy lives because no one knows how long they're going to be around heart condition or not, really. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Well, thank you both for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Lamb. It's been such a pleasure being here again, Anna. And thank you, Lauren. No problem. I enjoy being on the show. Well, thank you for coming on the show today. That concludes this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern Time. Until then, please check out our website, hearttoheartwithanna.com, and visit our Facebook page. Most importantly, remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you've been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next week.